You're right. You're right. Okay. That's okay for me. Oh, we just lost video. It's back. It, and it swapped monitors, I think. No, did it just not. There we go. Okay. Cool. Uh, hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, did lots of people end up making it to the keynote this morning? Yeah. yeah? Was anyone else as surprised as I was to see Drupal's governance and community model being used as a model for all sorts of other open source communities? I don't know, I've never, I just could not believe that that was a thing that's actually happening. So it was pretty cool to uh, get to watch and see how it all played out. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Andrew Berry, and uh, I'm a senior architect at Lullabot. And with me on stage is. Hi everybody, I'm Juan P. Uh, Juan PNR is my Twitter username, is there. I just tweeted the slides, so in case you want to open the links as we go through them, feel free to open them there. Uh, we work at Lullabot, which is a strategy design and development company. We were one of the first Drupal-focused agencies to be founded uh, years and years ago now, and uh, both of us have been with uh, Lullabot for quite some time. And, uh, through many of our different projects working there, we've had different kinds of opportunities to bring continuous integration into the, the projects that we work on. And uh, through the, the different companies and teams that we've worked with, we've started to come down to uh, one set of principles, which is that continuous integration is all about enabling your team to deliver more software, better software, and software that lives and is useful for a longer period of time. But every time you and your team start to bring continuous integration into a project, you really need to focus on making sure that you manage the risk to your individual sprints, the risk to the whole product, and any sort of financial risks to your, your team and your overall company budgets. When I looked at continuous integration in Wikipedia, I realized that the definition is very wide, so I wanted to set some boundaries for this session. Every time I have implemented continuous integration in a team, um, it was to make the peer review process as easy as possible. Normally, when I work within a development team, everybody who wants to make changes to the code uh, should create a pull request, and that pull request should be reviewed and merged or discussed by others. Um, so there are a few things in this process, uh, especially for the ones who are reviewing that I believe that could be automated and I could see other people um, uh, joining this effort as well. Um, things like running PHP unit tests and verifying that they pass. If they are BHA tests, making sure that they pass. Uh, taking code in a standard, generating a coverage report. These are things that when I'm looking at a pull request, um, if I can get some feedback, just making sure that these checks are passing, then um, <laughs> this green button that I'm seeing here, I want to make it as big as possible. I want to make it as easy as fast as possible so for somebody to just focus in looking at the code, making sure that it meets the ticket requirements, making sure that all the checks are fine, and are merging it. So uh, I started with Jenkins CI years ago. Uh, I remember I, I had a talk about how I was using Drupal with Jenkins for doing things like uh, running cron or deploying code automatically to development when uh, it was merged onto master. And then I started doing it also for other sort of CI. Um, it was, it was uh, Andrew who introduced me to Circle CI, the client that we were working with before was using it already. And, and we decided to move a few things to, uh, from the current uh, Jenkins CI implementation that we have into Circle CI, and I loved it because we'll see we'll see in detail uh, why. And then lately, just uh, I wanted to compare Circle CI with Travis CI. Uh, I've used Travis CI in open source, uh, but I've never used it with a full Drupal site. So I I took a Drupal 8 uh, project and added Travis CI exactly the same as I did with Circle. We'll see a comparison between them in a little bit. 
Yeah, and something we want to make sure is clear is that just because we chose these three tools for this topic doesn't mean that they are even necessarily the absolute best tools out there. Uh, when we are working with a new client and getting processes in place, we always like to say that the best continuous integration tool is the one you already have. So, uh, you know, maybe your team is using GitLab internally on a hosted GitLab instance. Look into its CI tools because it's got a great suite of tools. If you're on Bitbucket, look into Bitbucket pipelines. Uh, it's often a lot easier to bring in CI into your organization if you're not having to set up new business relationships with a CI provider or get provisioning for something that you're hosting yourself. So here are some of the tools that we have used to implement the jobs. Uh, Drush, usually for running database updates, installing Drupal, importing configuration. Uh, Robo is a task manager uh, in PHP. I, I must admit I love this one because I'm terrible at writing shell scripts. And with Robo, I was able to do the same, but um, within a PHP class. So uh, I know that uh, Drush uh, is using it as well too. Docker for spinning up and tearing down environments, and then BHAT for behavioral testing. So here's a summary of what we found out over the past few years. Um, if a team would ask me nowadays, uh, hey, we, we are looking forward to implement continuous integration for a Drupal 8 project, uh, what tool shall we use? Because there are many out there. Um, from the ones I've tried, I would suggest the team to either go for CircleCI or TravisCI. I've, I've written a couple articles. They are at the Lullabot blog with just my personal experience about them. You can do the same. Uh, Travis CI may require a little bit more setup, but also uh, more flexibility. So it depends on the team. Um, also, if you, for some reason, you cannot uh, uh, use Travis CI or Circle CI as a third party, they offer behind your firewall services, so they can be installed inside your network. Um, so have a look at that. So let's start with Jenkins. Uh, what we see here in the background is a typical Jenkins da dashboard uh, with jobs and their status. Uh, let me pass, let me move on. So here, uh, what we do with Jenkins is um, everything goes through the UI. Uh, so it's a web interface. Um, this is a shell step uh, where we were running, uh, in this case it was BHA tests. Uh, Andrew created a Docker image uh, based on the official Drupal image. For this particular client, uh, we were managing modules, not full Drupal sites. So what we would do is we would run a Docker command that would build a container, we would pass the module to that container and then run a script that was part of the repository. We did that so we could uh, put at least the scripts uh, under version control. Um, so for a newcomer, Jenkins is really, uh, really useful because um, you install plugins via the web interface, you create new jobs via the web interface, define steps, conditions. Um, if you have never done CI, it's really easy. It, ha it also has some cons that we'll see in a bit. So here's uh, the, the script that we were running before. Um, what we're doing here is uh, we are starting uh, Apache. We, are, we have here a, a robo task to install Drupal. And, and then we were using at that time PhantomJS. Uh, I think we, this, is, this was for maybe a couple of years ago. We then moved on to headless Chrome. And then finally we were running BHAT test uh, providing a configuration file. So the setup for Jenkins is you take a server, you install, uh, you install it there, and then you go through the process of installing a few plugins so you can start uh, creating your jobs. Um, these two plugins are the ones we use the most to connect Jenkins with a repository, to watch for repository changes. And then after that, um, it's a matter of going through the web interface to create the jobs and configure them to adjust your continuous integration strategy. Some of the pros is that it's free and customizable. You just need somewhere to install it and then there you go. Um, also, because you're starting from scratch, uh, you can be very specific uh, at, with your implementation. For example, I, I started messing around with the commit mes st status messages here. Uh, for example, if the code coverage uh, job would pass, I would also print the coverage statistics. If some of these other jobs would fail, I could say, I could say there how many tests were failing, for example. What I wanted to, uh, to do with this was, uh, well, um, provide here some feedback so it was not necessary to click on the details to view the full report. Again, making that merge button as big as possible and easy as possible to move on. 
Also, uh, Jenkins has been there for ages. I, I read the other day, uh, Jenkins is seven or eight years old, but it, it spun up from uh, Hudson, another project which is already 14 years old. So uh, there are lots of documentation, articles, recipes. Uh, there's a high probability that what you're trying to do with Jenkins, there is already either a plug in there or somebody has written an article that explained you how to do it. Also, uh, because you're in full control of the infrastructure, not only you can spin up a Docker environment to do, run a command, you can also persist that environment if you need to. Um, I remember that um, we, we worked with a QA team that uh, wanted to mix and match the modules that we maintain to set up a Drupal site a la Simply Test Me and do some testing. So what we did is I, I took the BHAT job that we had and uh, I adjusted it, uh, I made a clone of it. And instead of running the BHAT test suite on top of it, I assigned a port uh, to it and just made it available. And then there was another Jenkins job that would watch for uh, merge or close events from GitHub and then it would destroy the environment. So some of the cons, um, yes it's free, but it takes you a lot of time to set up and it's not easy to um, get, the set, get a certain setup and then replicate that uh, anywhere else, uh, especially when you're moving on to different projects. Uh, so that takes a lot of time. I also had to monitor hard disk space and memory. Some jobs would generate logs that wouldn't be uh, perched. Uh, I would find zombie Docker containers running there and that was sometimes problematic. And because it's so oriented to the web interface, um, even though that's something good to start with, once your jobs get, start getting a, a little bit more complex, you run into the problem in which um, you want to make some changes to the job, and it's impossible to make those changes in the job without breaking the job for a while. So you, that would affect development. And uh, you know something else with Jenkins is that as the self-hosted option, you're responsible for maintaining it. And uh, after having used Jenkins on many, many different projects, I mean, I think the first time uh, I used it was probably 2010. Uh, you know, we wanted to look back and get an idea for how much are we actually spending to maintain and use Jenkins, and how does that compare to the other options that are out there? So. Uh, you know, for these numbers, we were looking at a team of eight developers, and in this case, it wasn't a single site, it was a bunch of different Drupal modules as individual repositories, and uh, when we look at those jobs that we were looking at before, uh, if you were to run them one after the other, meaning not at the same time in parallel, you're looking at about 18 minutes total CPU time. And they're obviously, you know, not all the same amount of time. Unit tests run really fast, and BHAT tests are probably the slowest to run. Um, and then we're also assuming that each developer on average does about one pull request a day, but that they're testing more than one commit because they might push up a commit, open a pull request, and then realize that they broke a test and need to do some fixes and submit another pull request to be tested. Uh, and we're also assuming that the team runs some of your tests locally, meaning that they're not just pushing up work in progress commits for the sake of testing, that they do know one way or another how to run those tests locally, which is reducing the load on your, your Jenkins server. Uh, most of the time when we have worked with clients to set up Jenkins or when we've come into a client and they already have Jenkins, they've basically got something like this where it's an EC2 instance as a VPS, meaning that they're not using uh, you know, Amazon's APIs to manage the system, they're just treating it like any other virtual server on the internet. And the main reason we find for this when we talk to our clients and we talk to ourselves is that it's the easiest to understand and set up. Uh, you know, but uh, the server is always there being paid for on weekends, on nights, on evenings, uh, you know, well, nights or evenings. Uh, and, uh, you know, it doesn't help when you have activity spikes, like at the end of a sprint, you know, maybe you had a long weekend. Everyone was out, uh, you know, Friday uh, for a holiday, and then you come back the Monday and you're at the end of a sprint and you're like, oh, we got to go, 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 get all these pull requests merged and tested. Uh, and if you just got a single uh, server, you know, it's not scaling up and down to handle that. And, uh, you know, when we talk to some teams, uh, you know, the answer is just, oh, well, just auto scale it. Doesn't Amazon make that easy? Um, not really. 
And you know, when we look at most of the enterprise Drupal 8 websites we're working with, unless they're using a completely managed service provider, they do not have auto-scaling for their production Drupal website. So if they don't have auto-scaling at that level, what are the chances your Drupal-focused development team is going to enable a fully auto-scaled Jenkins server for something which is not directly related to production? So uh, you, know, you might think auto-scaling is your way out of it, but unless you are already doing that throughout your organization, it's probably not something that's actually going to happen. So in this case, this was an Amazon EC2 instance, and we were spending about $300 a month for it. And you know, in terms of sizing, uh, you know, Composer Update uses a ton of memory. Uh, it used to be way, way worse back in the day. Like I'd saw, see it take four or six gigs of memory to do Composer Update. Um, you know, since the Composer packages are now hosted on Drupal.org and the repositories are split between Drupal 7 and Drupal 8, it's significantly better. But even then, we're still looking at around half a gig to a gig of memory. And you know, for a server like this, maybe you're able to get up to 48 concurrent jobs if you're using 24 gigs of RAM for Jenkins. But uh, we always found that the CPU limits were hitting first. And of course, you could just try and you know, go to a different sized instance and try to tune that. But that's more time you've got to spend tuning and rebuilding and seeing you know, how it works. Maybe you get it tuned for you know, uh, less memory, and then all of a sudden something changes in some library that you're using, and you need a lot more memory per job. And you don't know that until your jobs are failing and someone spends half a day trying to figure out what's going on. <coughs> so uh, I actually went into our time tracking system, and I pulled out uh, all of Wampy's hours for a project. And he spent 116 hours where he logged entries with you know, Jenkins, continuous integration, or just the word continuous. And this was a project with no migration, so there was no continuous migration entries being tagged. And you, know, you take that at your rate for an employee that you're paying or the rate you're paying your, your contractors, you're literally looking at hundreds to thousands of dollars of employee time a month uh, on top of your hosting bills. And that, in this case, this doesn't include the client hours for the clients we were working with where they had dedicated DevOps and infrastructure en engineers who were providing the underlying Amazon hosting and so on. So the, the realistic costs of this were a lot higher. Um, and when it comes down to it, you know, for teams here at a conference like this, like your team probably knows Drupal and PHP and JavaScript, and maybe the people in this room, maybe we know Jenkins. But what happens when you know, you're working on critical features and you don't have time to maintain Jenkins during those moments? Uh, what happens where you move on to a different team or a different project? Who's going to maintain those instances? The knowledge pool for Jenkins uh, is not very wide within a programming community. And so it really comes down to that the costs of hosting Jenkins are really related to the expertise of your DevOps staff. And you could pay someone to be a Jenkins expert, an Amazon expert, to handle auto-scaling and really making sure everything is running smoothly. But you may actually end up spending even more money because Jenkins experts and cloud experts are very expensive. So uh, you've really got to, to look at those numbers for your specific organization to see which way makes the most sense if you're going to be hosting Jenkins internally. Andrew did the initial effort of taking one of the modules we were maintaining and porting some of the Jenkins jobs that we had to CircleCI. And I saw, the, I saw the set of changes and he told me this is great, so you should try it. I took another module and, and follow his approach. And I must say, I, I was very impressed. In minutes, I was seeing the jobs running in the, in the Travis CI dashboard and them being reported back at the pull request. I'm talking minutes. I, it, me, for me, setting up um, and fully configuring uh, Jenkins systems for a team normally uh, would take me from hours to days, depending on the team's infrastructure and the CI demands. Um, so that already looked promising. Here is uh, an excerpt of the CircleCI uh, YAML file. This file lives at the root of the repository, and it defines everything that CircleCI should do when you uh, make changes to the repository. We define a uh, work workflow uh, where you can set, where we set uh, four jobs, one for running BHAT tests, another one for uh, PHP unit tests, and another one for code coverage, and another one for checking code in standards. 
The reason why um, we split the code coverage report out of the PHP unit tests is because um, we, were, we benefited from the workflows at CircleCI. You can set dependencies, so only run a particular job if a condition is met. Code coverage generates, takes a lot of time and, and uses a lot of memory. And, but PHP unit tests, they can run really fast, right? So we wanted to give faster feedback to developers. We made the code coverage report uh, job dependent on the PHP unit one. So only if PHP unit tests were passing, then we would generate a code coverage report. Um, here, let's go quickly through the syntax. Um, we benefited here from, uh, these are uh, YAML aliases. It's like a way to reuse steps or variables, if you want to call it that way. Uh, we're checking out the code. Uh, we are set defining here the uh, cache strategy. We used it just to cache some of the composer files, so builds would run, would run faster. And here is the meat of the job. At this point, we moved most of the implementation to Robo, so Robo would define a set of tasks, one per job. This was great because when then I took this to Travis, um, I could reuse most of this stuff. And then finally, uh, we are storing search results, so CircleCI can present them in uh, the web interface. And also we're storing some artifacts, so for example, uh, the code coverage report can be browsed. The setup, if you have already a CircleCI config YAML file, you add, it to the, you add it to the repository. If not, you go straight to number two, which is authenticating yourself with either GitHub or Bitbucket, and then you allow CircleCI to watch for rep repository changes. Um, CircleCI may either uh, analyze your repository and suggest a uh, a uh, config YAML file uh, for you to start with, or maybe you can just click the technology you're using and use a template. Let's see some of the pros and cons of CircleCI. Um, as I said, you can define workflows, a, a set of jobs that uh, will run in parallel. Uh, depending on the concurrency level that you are using, this may actually run in parallel or they'll, they'll run one after another. And it uses well, ha anybody here has ever used Docker Compose? Right, so I, I wonder if for some, any of you uh, this looks more or less familiar. Um, this is also part of the CircleCI config file. Here I'm defining the mix of images that I want to use uh, for my jobs. Uh, what I did in this case is I created a Drupal 8 project with a Composer Drupal, uh, Drupal project and, and then uh, this is an extension of the official Drupal image where I'm just removing Drupal core from it because I'm gonna use I'm gonna use a full project instead. I'm also adding Xdebug Composer uh, to it. Then we also use in Chrome for Selenium because we want to run Behat tests and finally MariaDB uh, as a database server. Yeah, one of the things I really love about uh, Circle setup is if you've used Docker Compose before, you have to manually set up the links between containers, which is actually really painful when you're dealing with BHAT tests because you've basically got two codependent containers for networking. And Circle basically makes it so every image to the jobs is as if they're on a single server. So you're talking to MySQL over localhost, you're talking to Selenium over localhost. You don't have to think about it, which is a pretty neat feature. <coughs> You also get SSH access to jobs. This is great for uh, post-mortem debugging. Uh, if you have ever done CI, it's, it's frustrating when a job fails and you think, oh, it must be because of this. So you make a small change, push, wait, and it fails again. <laughs> and then not only you are polluting the branch you're working with, but you're also wasting a lot of time. Being able to jump into the environment after the job has finished so you can run some commands and figure out what's, what's right, it, it will save you a lot of time. Also, CircleCI offers a command line interface. Because it uses Docker to build an environment and run whatever you want it to run, you can run the same thing. You download their command line interface and you do CircleCI build and here in the, in the screenshot, for example, what we see below the command I'm running is um, the CircleCI command and interface pulling down the images uh, into my local and then running the jobs. This is great because I can, I can jump into the containers in my local environment and do my own debugging. Um, it helps me, for example, when I want to verify that uh, 
jobs are passing before even creating a pull request. So uh, when I do, I'm, I'm pretty sure that jobs are going to pass. Some of the cons is that, well, it's not free. You, it's, a, it's a software as a service, and uh, the, free, uh, the free, I would say that the free service is, is good for you just to get a taste, to see how it works. For example, um, I, I'm, a, I'm maintaining the uh, Drupal Camp Spain website, and I added this to it, and it is perfect for, for our needs. And if you need better concurrency, you may need to look uh, for upgrading. And also because um, you're in, not in full control of the infrastructure, um, you may need to adjust your continuous integration strategy to what CircleCI offers to you. Yeah, so when uh, we looked at the cost for CircleCI, it's really interesting because it did take us about 50 hours to set up CircleCI across 10 different repositories. But something to keep in mind with that is we had a ton of Jenkins experience going into doing the same thing with Jenkins. So we basically went from we literally have no idea what we're doing with Circle to done, meaning we learned the service, we set it up, we made it work and be repeatable across multiple different repositories in about 50 hours. And now that we've done it once, it would be way, way less. Like for setting up similar projects right now, it's probably, if you were to say, hey, Andrew, could you set up 10 repositories? It'd probably take me half a day or a day at most. Um, and what was really interesting is that with Jenkins, the hours that were spent maintaining it were fairly even month to month across those 15 months. So it wasn't just you know, an initial sprint of setting it up followed by you know, minimal maintenance. There was actually pretty decent amounts of maintenance throughout that time period. And what we found with Circle is once we did get it finished set up, uh, being set up, you basically had no maintenance. You could pretty much ignore it, which was kind of fun. Um, and the only time that you really are forced to do any sort of maintenance is really a software issue, which is when you're doing Drupal core upgrades. You know, if you have your module and you're testing against Drupal 8.4, then you're going to need to update the containers so that they have Drupal 8.5, make sure everything passes. You know, maybe uh, the PHP unit configuration changes those sorts of things, but that's not really circles you know, it's on Circle's responsibility, and that's going to be the same regardless of whether you're using Jenkins, Circle, Travis, or anything else. And uh, from a pricing perspective, you know, you can go all the way down to free. So the way their limits are is that one uh, job concurrency limit is for private repositories. So if you're dealing with a public repository, you actually get up to four concurrent jobs throughout uh, the month, which is great for you know open source or just work you don't have to keep private. But for private repositories, because you're paying month to month, uh, maybe you have a really large team today and you want your tests to always run really fast and get that feedback as quickly as you can. So you go all the way up to uh, eight containers and each container costs $50 a month. Uh, and then your project is done and your team goes on to something else completely differently and the site is still there, you could scale it all the way down to one container or two containers and your jobs will still work. You don't have to change anything about your integration. It just means when someone does do a pull request, those jobs are going to run one after the other instead of all at the same time. So you have a lot of flexibility there, which is uh, pretty nice. So as I said before, I've used Travis in the past with uh, open source projects, but I thought, how about for a Drupal 8 project? And that would also give me a chance to compare Circle CI and Travis CI. Um, they, are, they are the same. Like You can do the same. Setup process is the same. You may need to do a little bit more setup with Travis CI, but you will end up with exactly what you get with Circle. You may also have more flexibility for your, for your continuous integration, so that may be also a good thing. Travis CI has been uh, out there for seven years, and uh, there's a lot of documentation uh, online about it. Symphony Project, for example, uses it, so it's very popular. Um, it's very it's very probable that uh, in your team somebody knows it already, which is also a good thing. Here's an excerpt of the Travis YAML file that uh, I added to that Drupal project. Um, here we're defining the cache strategy. We're also caching some of the composer files. Uh, Travis has a different approach than Circle. Circle lets you define the mix of images you want to use, while Travis has two environments, uh, trusty or precise, with a lot of tools already built in, uh, available for you to enable. Um, out of those tools, I needed the Docker service, because in this case, um, especially for running the BHAT tests, where there, are, there is a database, there is a web browser, um, there is Chrome as well, 
running, uh, I wanted to define my environment using uh, Docker Compose. So I took uh, the Docker for Drupal uh, template and uh, that's what I'm, what I'm using here within this robo task. So what we're doing here is we are leveraging the test matrix to define these three, this, this variable, the job variable, which each of these values will be passed to a robo command. Uh, this then turns into three different jo jobs that will run in parallel when somebody makes changes. And again, all the implementation on each of these jobs, it's within the robo tasks. Uh, if you're curious, by the way, uh, this link takes you to the actual implementation so you can um, see the full details. The setup is identical to CircleCI. Um, you add a Travis YAML file to your repository, and if not, you go to step two, authenticate, and then use a template that uh, Travis will provide to you. And then you allow Travis CI to watch for repository changes, and there you go. Everybody, somebody makes changes to the repository, Travis will uh, trigger the jobs and report the status in the pull request. So some, some of the pros, um, I found a lot of uh, useful documentation as I was going through implementing the uh, CI for Travis, which is also a good thing. And some of the cons is that, uh, that I found Travis doesn't have the concept of artifacts as CircleCI does. So in my particular case, I wanted to host somewhere uh, a coverage report. Um, look at the, I looked at the documentation and, and Travis suggested that you either upload the files to an S3 bucket at the end of the job, and they also mentioned this tool, which ended up being really nice, uh, coveralls. Um, you authenticate your, with your GitHub account against coveralls, and then you run a command at the end of the Travis YAML file. That command automatically finds the um, coverage report and uploads them to the coveralls website, and it also integrates with your pull request. It will tell you uh, whether coverage is going up or down in that particular pull request, which I think is great. Also, Travis CI supports Docker, but needs a little bit more setup. I, I ended up finding that gives me also more flexibility for this particular implementation. Um, I was using Docker Compose for running the BHAT test job, but I was using the, the precise uh, environment in Travis to do, for, for example, checking coding standards because that's all I needed. And also, it doesn't, uh, Travis doesn't offer a command line interface, but you can overcome this by implementing this in a certain way. Because we moved most of the logic to uh, Robo, and we were using Docker Compose to build the environment, I could run the task locally and that would be fine. Like I would get pretty much the same output and results that I would get them in Travis. So I, I realize this is not actually a problem. Yeah, and something else to keep in mind with that is that by keeping as much of your test logic outside of the CI configuration, it makes it a lot easier to do something like what he's talking about, like run it locally. And so uh, you know, following that model gives you a lot of flexibility. Um, so you've looked at all these services and you're excited about one of them or maybe more than one of them and you really want to bring these tools into your team and probably the first conversation that's going to come up is not actually the cost uh, of the, the finances because uh, you know that's usually not a big deal, but it, what's the cost on the team? What's the cost on your workflows? What's the cost on the deliveries that you need to make? And uh, you know, when you start talking to your developers, you're totally going to hear them say that tests are too hard, that they've tried writing tests before, they spent a week writing tests, didn't get anywhere, and ended up throwing them out so they could get their tickets done. Um, you're totally going to talk to QA folks, and they're gonna say, sure, it's great that you're writing all of these tests uh, for you know, B hat regression tests, for example. But wait a minute, it's our job to not trust the development team. Just because you're writing tests doesn't mean that you wrote the right tests. Uh, you know, how does this actually make our lives any easier or better? Um, you're going to talk to your project managers, and they're going to say, "Sure, test coverage sounds great, but you know, when I worked on it on a couple previous projects with teams, I discovered that they were spending all their time writing tests." to prove the bug was fixed rather than fixing the bugs that were bringing the site down. Uh, and when you talk to your product owners, uh, they're just going to say, we need to deliver. Uh, you know, these are the words that every product owner is it's just saying, okay, I don't care how you do it, but you have to deliver these features by that date because we have this contract. So 
uh, before you start saying to your team, hey, we need to do all of this continuous integration and testing and so on, you really need to evaluate your project to see if it's a good fit for continuous integration because not every project is a good fit. Uh, you know, one of the first questions I like to ask myself and ask a team is the code that you're writing, are you expecting it to last for six months or many, many years? Uh, if you're building a Drupal 8 marketing website uh, for an event that's a one-time event that's going to launch and be shown and then turned into static HTML when it's done, it's probably not worth writing BHAT tests for that unless uh, you know there's a serious economic reason. Maybe you're selling tickets or something like that through the same site. But you know if you're just going to stop maintaining the site fairly soon because it's got a, a limited shelf life, uh, testing isn't necessarily worth the investment. Um, but for a project that is a long-term project, especially anything which is, I'm going to say, internal to business processes or API integrations, uh, you know, if you come into a team and you discover that the CMS you're replacing has been around for 12 years, odds are that your code is going to be around for 12 years as well. Um, you know, and we also like to look at this not just from a code perspective, but from a business perspective. Some industries, some businesses are in a growth phase where they do create one product, they create one website, they create one feature, and then that feature is still there and useful, but they go on to something new. They are adding and building out their, their portfolio of whatever it is they're doing. Um, or some businesses are in an industry that is under rapid change. And they have, they know that six or 12 months or 18 months down the line, what they're doing today is probably going to be completely irrelevant. You're going to have replaced 95% of the code that you're writing. So, uh, you know, this does play a little bit into the longevity of the code, but, you know, just because you write this great API integration for some mail service you're using and you really test it well, you know, maybe that API integration is only going to be used for eight months because you're just always changing those sorts of requirements at a business level. Uh, we also like to talk about how the code you're writing is going to be updated and distributed. Uh, maybe you're building a single website and you have complete control over how that website is being updated. So, you know, you need to fix a bug, you need to update a module, you need to update a new version of Drupal core, you just do it. Um, or maybe you're writing software that is being distributed to teams you don't even talk to. And, uh, you know, in those cases, it's a lot more important to be able to show those teams when you do have support issues and you need to have communication with them to say, look at our test suite, look at our coverage, look at all of the, the BHAT tests we're providing as a part of this software, uh, you know, uh, to show that what you are delivering is what they're expecting of you. Um, and, you know, one edge case for this is, I like to call it like the one-time code dump. Sometimes you will work with teams who you're not really connected to, but for business reasons, you will write them some code. You'll write them a Drupal module, you'll write them a Drupal theme, whatever needs to be done, and then you're basically going to give it to them and never see that code again. Um, in those cases, you have to be really careful about how you integrate continuous integration, because if it's, you know, unless it's a multi-year project, how do you know that that team is using the same tooling you're going to use or that they even care about continuous integration? You know, it, it, it's really expensive to do a full continuous integration workflow for a piece of code for four or six months just to give it to another team to have them turn that all off. That's a lot of wasted uh, investment. Uh, and then also the environment your code is running in. is If you're a single site, then you control the PHP version, the Drupal version, all the modules, all the libraries, everything. Uh, if you are distributing your code, maybe you need to support PHP 5.6 through to 7.2. Maybe you need to make sure that you work on more than one version of Drupal. Uh, as soon as you start adding these variables to what your team needs to support, then the, the business case for continuous integration starts to make a lot more sense because you don't want to have to have every developer switching between four releases of PHP to make sure they didn't accidentally use some PHP 7.1 feature in code that needs to run on PHP 5.6. Uh, QA planning is also really important as well. And uh, in terms of team structure, we have found the most success comes when your QA team has some development in PHP experience. 
Uh, if you have developers who you can bring into your QA team to not just help with the test plans, but actually work on the automated tests, uh, it really helps leverage the continuous integration tooling that you're using for just your development team. It means that your uh, QA team can start to become confident in the tests that you are working on. So when you get back to these conversations with your developers and they tell you that tests are too hard, uh, remind them that tests are really tools and that the APIs that you use in writing tests teach you the underlying systems. Uh, you know, you're mocking test data, you are making sure that your code is well architected and able to be tested in the first place. You're making sure that tests are repeatable over time and not just today. These are all good things for a stable and quality code base. And when it comes down to it, tests are too hard is not an argument about skills, it's an argument about time. And if you are spending all, you know, what seems like an inordinate amount of time working on tests, then maybe it's time to step back and stop working on tests and fix your underlying code base. When your QA team says to you that, you know, we don't trust the tests that you're working on and we're not saving any time by doing this, uh, you know, make sure that your QA team starts to become completely integrated with your development teams. They need to be on the same meetings, they need to be uh, on the same retrospectives, they need to be part of the team and just as important as development and design and project management. And they need to be able to say, you know, hey, you wrote a BHAT test and that's great, but the, what you wrote is not actually what we want to test. They need to be able to look at what the developers are writing and what they're writing. Yeah, you know, as a developer, you need to be able to say, hey, I think I've got some good BHAT tests here. Can you take a look and use your QA skills to come up with new test cases? Uh, when your project managers are worried about the time spent on tests, Talk to them about how important it is to be tactical about what to test. You don't need to test literally every single line of code on a Drupal site. You're not going to bother duplicating tests for Drupal core. You're not going to necessarily test every little theme feature that is there. You're going to focus on the features that are either the most important from a stability and maintenance perspective or the features that are directly related to uh, your site's ability to generate income. Uh, and it's really important to trust your developers. When your developers say, I want to spend the next morning finishing up the test cases on something, what they're telling you is that they want to spend the next morning making sure they didn't break anything. So give them the time to do that so that way you're discovering those bugs during the development phase and not the release phase. And also, track your hours. It's really helpful to be able to go back and say, I feel like we were spending too much time on some, you know, testing or continuous integration. And if you are tracking your hours effectively, you can get that information, find out whether it's just a feeling or whether it's reality. And when your product owners say, I don't care what you do, we just need to deliver, talk to them about how continuous integration is a necessary step to continuous delivery. Uh, you cannot be continuously delivering a product without having a continuous integration system underlying that philosophy. Uh, you know, think about like how many people in this room have had to deploy a hotfix to production on a Friday night. Um, you know, delivery of that sort of hotfix is a lot faster and easier to do if you have good continuous integration in place. Uh, I remember one time early in my time at Lullabot, there was a hotfix I had to deploy involving a settings.php change, and I totally deleted a semicolon by mistake. Uh, so that meant that instead of one page on the website breaking, now every single page was throwing a PHP error. Uh, so that was not good. Uh, but if we had had continuous integration in place, the systems would have told me right off the bat, hey, I can't run your BHAT test because literally every page is broken and we wouldn't have made things worse in production. You know, hot fixes are stressful and anything you can do to reduce those stress, stresses is going to make your team happier and more effective. So that's a lot to, to think about when you need to discuss bringing continuous integration into your team. And so uh, you know, I'd like to try and condense this down into uh, you know, some talking points that you can bring to your team. So first of all, you know, for de the developers on your team, talk about how you will shorten the testing cycle. Uh, how instead of having to write code, merge code, wait a day or two for QA to get back to you and then deal with whatever fixes you need to do, you're going to get that immediate feedback. 
Um, but then in terms of helping to manage that sprint risk, which we talked about way at the beginning, you know, time box the effort that you're putting into setting up your initial continuous integration uh, strategy. Assume it's going to take you at least one hour. Uh, you know, maybe if you have experience with a tool already and you've done it before, it's going to be less, but you know, it's not going to realistically take you less than an hour. Um, if you've never done anything like this before, it's totally reasonable, even with a pre-built hosted service, to assume you're going to spend half a sprint learning the system and getting it up and running. Um, and if it's taking you longer than that, if you find that you spend a week trying to set up testing and it's not working or you're not feeling, you're not like you're making progress, uh, that's a really good time to step back and think about why that is. And usually that's a case where you need to then look back at your team composition, your team processes and your code and figure out where those frictions are coming from. For uh, you know, QA and project managers, uh, you know, it, this really changes the, the job description for a lot of QA folks. A lot of QA teams spend a third or half their time doing regression testing by hand. And uh, once you have, you know, say, a full BHAT suite covering your website, QA's focus becomes not on doing the regression testing because you're writing code to automate those regression tests, but on writing new test cases, which when it comes down to it is what the QA teams, every QA team I've ever worked with, that's what they're best at. You know, uh, you get the best results when you can say to your QA teams, you have a week to do nothing, but think about new and insidious ways to break my code. Uh, and uh, you know, that leads to a higher quality product. Uh, but then to help manage the product risk, especially if you are delivering something to other teams or other organizations, having the metrics that you get from continuous integration, whether it's showing the change in code coverage over time, or whether it's showing uh, you know, uh, how many uh, parts of your system, you know, individual modules now have full test coverage. Uh, those are metrics that you get to share. Uh, the code quality reports that you can get by running either tools like PHPMD or PHPCS, or using you know, the various hosted services out there, it gives your technical project managers who may not know a lot about Drupal or PHP or even uh, the web, depending on where they're from, it gives them something to look at and say, we know this is well-architected code because it's following these best practices in terms of code structure and uh, you know, uh, code architecture. And for product owners and project managers, uh, you know, it's really important to share how once you have good continuous integration in place, you can totally start ignoring code that needs to be ignored because you know it's going to break. You can set up a nightly job that runs once a week or once a night to test against the latest, you know, minor point releases of everything that comes out and you'll get an email telling you, hey, guess what, our module broke and we need to now go fix it. But it also means that when developers are brought into a code base that they've never looked at, that maybe no one on the team has looked at, they've got tests and they've got reports and they've got all of this metadata about the health of the project that they can look at and start contributing right away. Um, and then in terms of the financial risk, you know, the, the monthly costs are relatively small given what you spend for a team of five or 10 developers, but they're also flexible, which is really the most important bit. You know you're not locking yourself into an expensive $2,000 a month contract for uh, you know, any of these services. Here are a few links for you to dive deeper if you like to. If you're looking forward to implement uh, continuous integration with Circle CI or Travis CI, uh, we have written an installer that will place a lot of files in your repository for uh, running the kind of jobs that we talked about. And that should help you to give you a foundation. We wanted to speed up as much as possible the setup process when you want to do, to do such kind of thing. And Andrew also maintains another, another installer for standalone modules. So if you have a Drupal 8 module in, in GitHub, then you can use Andrew's installer as well to implement a continuous integration for it. And also here's another link for the articles I've written about my personal experience with um, CircleCI and Travis CI. If you've never joined us uh, a Sprint, please, I encourage you to do it. It's a lot of fun. Uh, you can sec sit next to uh, people who drive uh, initiatives in, within the Drupal community. 
And uh, please, uh, if you enjoy this session, uh, fill out the survey and give us your feedback and questions. We are going to be after this session at the Lullabot booth. I think it's number 100. So if you don't have a chance to ask a question now or you just want to chat with us, feel free to join us. So we'll start now with the Q&A. I'm speaking from a position of mostly ignorance. I haven't used CI before, but I'm envisioning how I would use it. I'm kind of getting excited about the idea. Um, when you have a website that has uh, LDAP authentication, how do you test, uh, how do you have a robot test something that needs a person's uh, login to get into a website? Yeah, so there's a couple of different ways you could approach that. Um, if you're building on Drupal 8, wherever possible, um, again, I, I'm just going to take a two tacks. Like, there's the authentication against Drupal itself. Like, if it's just a Drupal user account and you're writing a BHAT test, then the Drupal extension, which is uh, part of the uh, pretty much any Drupal BHAT suite, lets you do something like create a new user with the given roles and then automatically log you in as that user. So when you push a commit, Circle CI will spin everything up, create the database, you know, or import the database, uh, and then you'll create that mock user that then you log in as. So that way you're not worried about encoding passwords or anything like that in your configuration, and you don't have to worry about that being broken. Um, if it's an external service, then you totally want to mock those HTTP calls, like if it's an OAuth login or something like that. In Drupal 8, it's actually pretty straightforward to hack the, like not hack, but hijack the HTTP client and say, hey, instead of actually executing this against a live service, return this JSON that I've got in a file that I want to run. And you can even do that with BHAT tests. So that way you're not dependent on that external service even being up. If it's Drupal 7, it's pretty much impossible to do that. So you need a test account or something. Hi there. Um, great session, but uh, for us, the biggest issue we have is CSS. And you know, a developer will change something here, it works on the page they're testing, and then they don't realize that it actually screws up all this other stuff. So do you guys have any recommendations for visual regression testing? Yeah. We've done some work with it in the past. But uh, me personally, I haven't done any visual regression testing. I know there are tools out there, but I cannot recommend any in particular. Have you, Andrew? Are you sure about that? Because yeah. Tugboat supports uh, visual regression testing. So uh, Tugboat's l a Lullabot uh, tool and service that basically does something like this, except it gives you an interactive website instead of running um, uh, you know, t uh, your tests and so on. So it does do, though, visual regression testing. Uh, between you know what's on master say and what's in your branch, uh, obviously it's not going to tell you if the changes are what you wanted or not, right? Like it's just going to highlight them and say you know do you, is this what you intended? Um, but that can be a really good tool for those sorts of situations. Ben Ben is the Tugboat uh, maintainer. Ben, yeah. do you know? Can you tell us what technology is Tugboat using to create the reports? All right. So, so you if, said if, Phantom JS and uh, sorry, what was the other thing? Just some image overlaying library. All right, and some image overlaying library, probably yeah. an NPM. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so feel free to go and ask Ben if you need more details. Uh, I guess two things. Uh, funny he should ask that because I submitted two sessions about doing visual regression testing in BHAT for like doing screenshot comparisons and things like that. Both were not accepted. So. Um, I'm a little, little bitter. Um, <laughs> next year. Yeah, hopefully next, next one. Um, one thing I wanted to point out, if you want really easy um, you know, continuous integration setups for your, for your project, uh, Acquia BLT is a really nice, uh, not Acquia specific tool set for uh, building and launching and testing your, uh, your site or your application. Uh, has built-in BHAT set up already, um, and will do all of your composer artifact builds, things like that. And you can, uh, with just one command, say, initialize this project for Travis. Um, so you get Travis set up right away, and uh, it's really, really helpful for that. And they are always looking for people to try doing, or try integrating other services like uh, Circle CI and 
other build, build platforms. So, you know, contribute if you can. So, right, thanks. Thank you. We'll give it a go. Yep, thanks. I'm curious if you guys have put any thought towards how to abstract this above like the repo like the site repository level. I imagine you have many clients, many sites, and you know, you implement it to the your to your best practice at that given moment, but we're always learning and six months later you're like, oh, in my best, you know, Today, my Circle CI configuration probably looks a little bit different than it did six months ago. So, we've recently solved um, this a little bit with deployments using Ansible roles and um, doing that in a different repository that um, all the sites can share. And I, I don't know if this is a one-to-one -one comparison, but is that interesting at all or make any sense? Yeah, so uh, what we do right now with our installers is, the thing is, there's certain files like the Circle CI configuration file or whatever that has to be on a per repository basis. And you actually want that because then it means you can easily make little tweaks to it over time that are specific to your project. We worked on systems before where everything was controlled, say, in Jenkins, and it was really painful when all of a sudden one module needed one new PHP extension and that affected every test that was out there. So uh, what our installers uh, do is that if you want to update, you rerun the installer. And because everything's in Git in your individual repository, then it's up to you as a developer to say, oh, I want this change. No, I don't want this change. You know, oh, this is a hack. I had to fix some bug that I no longer need. Um, you know, it's just, you just basically use git add dash dash interactive and, you know, do as you see fit for things like the circle files. Um, we currently put the robo file and so on into the Docker images and those are tagged with version numbers. So that way you know those aren't going to change out from under you and because that's in your configuration file for CI, you know, that's locked down. Um, what was the other thing that we do? No, maybe that's it. You got anything to add? Uh, yeah, uh, well, first of all, if you, if you have any code that is public on what you mentioned, we would like to see it. So if you can just link, link us to it via Twitter, I would really appreciate it because I'd like to have a look at it. Uh, when, so first of all, in my personal experience, every CI implementation is different. So once, once I'm done with a particular client or project, I, I, I let the team to just continue evolving that. What I found lately is because when I did the transition from Circle CI to Travis CI, I got to a point where everything was extracted into robo tasks. Mm -hmm. And I let the platform specific stuff from Circle and Travis out of it. So what I want to do now is I want to create a new repository that contains only the robo file. And then Circle CI and YAML inst uh, and Travis installers would use that. So because maybe now I want to move on to um, GitLab and I want to use those tasks. And that's as far as, as we can go because more than that, you know, you may break up things in other projects while, while making changes to this central implementation. But let's, let's see what you have anyway. That's great. Thanks for a great talk. Thanks. Uh, just speaking to the visual regression testing tools, uh, we're using one called backtrack.io, uh, which is like a third party service mm -hmm. that can integrate with basically any of your repositories. Okay, cool. Thank you. All right, that's it. So thanks, everybody, for coming. See you around. Yes, join us at the booth if you have more questions. Yep. Thank you. Hey, you made it. Thanks for coming. Are you, are you up now? Yeah. Have a nice trip there. See you.